Wagwan people, what's going down in Chinatown? So this one's a review on the Netflix series Chaos, a modern take on biblical myths. You can see that the image in front of you has been fragmented into three or compartmentalized into three. So the first part is in black and white. Then it gets colorful. Then it's even more colorful. First part is Tartarus. Second part is Earth. The last part is the heavens. Quick one. Who's watched this? Who's heard of this? And what were your thoughts regarding this? Now, what I found interesting about this whole production is how it relates to people in the modern day. We sometimes think, yo, those people back in the day were very superstitious. They were very religious and they were. And then we contrast that with today and there's not a lot of difference. The only difference is we've been taught today that those religious belief systems were myth. And the belief systems that we have today are real or is real. You understand? We're going to be also, as we examine the Netflix series, we're going to examine the deities. We're going to look at El, who's the father of the gods in the Hebrew, Canaanite, Pantheon and mythology. We're going to look at Jesus. We're going to look at Zeus and we're going to look at Cronus. So Cronus is the father of Zeus and Zeus defeats his father to become the dominating god. El, or Yahweh, gives his son as a sacrifice for the sins of humanity. Kronos is a titan associated with the day seven or the planet Saturn. Yahweh is known as a storm deity. Zeus is known as a lightning thunder deity. Yahweh gives a law on a mountain. Zeus gives a law on a mountain. Zeus is known as the Most High. Elion is known as the Most High. Shout out everybody though, who has made the brave transition from being a Justin believer or believer to being a critical analytical thinker. So now we're going to get into this series called Chaos, break it down a few things. So Chaos is a stylized British mythological black comedy television series created by Charlie Covell for Netflix. It, re it revolves around three humans as they discover their common connection to a prophecy and to each other while dealing with the corrupt and arrogant gods of the Greek and Roman mythology. The series was released on Netflix on the 29th of August 2024. This series was cancelled after one season. So it upset a lot of religious people, I'm assuming. But um, cancelled after one season, which is interesting. Cancel culture. We often use this cancel culture thing just for comedians and stuff like that. But I, I guess this program upset people because it went against them. Um, or maybe you could see certain things that were parallels. For example, in the Bible, the God of the Bible, you know he's a bit bipolar, right? You know the Bible is a recent invention. You know I can say these things because I research these things. I'm not believing in nothing. I'm knowing. All right? Not believing is about knowing. And when I say the God of the Bible, it doesn't mean I am anti a creator or anti God. I'm just saying the God of the Bible isn't God. And the God of the Quran isn't God. And the God of the Talmud isn't God. God is outside of books. But let's get back into this presentation and that's not to offend that's just my opinions and that's what it is so this series was cancelled after just one season so let's look into this a little bit more what i found interesting was blasphemy zeus didn't like blasphemy he was upset when the people blasphemed his holy name and he was manipulating the weather to invoke prophetic homages. <laughs> I found that interesting. Do you know that there's, there's um, technology now that you can use to induce certain weather patterns, tornadoes, hurricanes, earthquakes? You know there's actual technology which people can use to manipulate molecules 
in the atmosphere to create certain weather patterns, to create cer certain weather turbulences, you can actually engineer that now, today. And what if you could increase that engineering? What if you could increase the frequency? You could have a lot of homage, a lot of revivals into religious buildings. So anyway, on Mount Olympus, the capricious and cruel god Zeus rules over a modern Greek world and expects mortals to pay frequent public homage to him. He is upset with the desecration of Mount Olympia. He is upset over the desecration of the Olympia Day monument in Crete and rages that the people are not paying him sufficient respect. A small wrinkle has appeared on Zeus's forehead, a sign of aging that should not appear on an immortal, and he frets that it may be that it may represent the line mentioned in the prophecy that he was given by the fates. He summons Prometheus to seek assurances that the prophecy will not come to pass. Dionysus, Zeus's son, seeks more godly responsibility but is rebuffed by both his father and his father's sister, wife, Hera. So another thing about Zeus as well, Zeus, his wife or his consort, is his sister. Father of the gods, Father Abraham marries his half-sister, Sarah, which is another story. Or should we address the story? Sarah, Abe. Raham. Ah. Anyway, so Zeus is married to his sister Hera, and they have children on Mount Olympus. They have several different children of different gifts. All right. So then he he Dionysus is an interesting character too. He was known for a lot of wine and bread, just like Mithras, just like Melchizedek. He steals his father's watch. The mortal, Riddy, um, meets this woman called Cassandra who tells her that today is the day on which she would leave her husband, Orpheus. Now, Orpheus is an interesting story. Orpheus is the story that inspired Lot's wife. The, the, the Bible is not unique in any way, shape, or f I'll say that again. Quote me. The Bible is not unique in any way, shape, or f it's actually a fraudulent book and put together at certain times in Alexandria, taking people's stories from here, there and everywhere. All right. That's just what it is from what it isn't. But let's continue though. So Orpheus is the, the story behind Lot's wife. All right. So Orpheus, with whom she has fallen out of love, Riddy visits her mother, Atatia, priestess who reminds Riddy of her prophecy. It is the same as Zeus, although supposedly no two prophecies should ever be the same. Riddy is hit by a lorry and is killed. A heartbroken Orpheus tries to commit suicide but is interrupted by Dionysus, who tells him of a way he can be reunited with her. So in the classical Greek story, Orpheus goes all the way down into Hades, tries to, re to retrieve his wife on a condition that they don't look back. I think he or his wife looks back. And as a result, she's taken back to Hades. You see these popular motifs in many stories throughout the Levant. Let's just cross comparison. El and Zeus. All right. So Zeus is known as the father of the gods. El is known as the father of the gods. El abounds on a mountain. Zeus lives on a mountain. The symbol of El is a bull. The symbol of Zeus is a bull. Now, what they leave out of the Bibles is that El Elyon, if we're made in the image of God, which is male and female, right? Why did they take out the female element from the deities and the pantheons? They do that on purpose because over time, there was a lot of politics between male and female, just like there is today. There's nothing new under the sun, as they say, Solomon. Again, a fictitious name invented by the church. A lot of these names in these books, they're not genuine. Check it out outside of your book and your program, church program. So El is the father of the gods and Zeus is the father of the gods. Elion also had children. He had 70 children when you go to the Ugaritic texts and other texts that built up the Elion narrative in the first place. He had about 70 children. You have minor gods, lesser gods. 
as you find in the Pantheon. Then you have the Most High God who sits in the most exalted place. And the Most High God is often a man who is accompanied by a woman or a wife. All right. So our wife was a woman called Asha Ra. When people say Shalom or Shalom or Shalom and all these different variations of Shalom, which means peace, you're actually calling upon Shalim, which was a part of the Canaanite pantheon, Hebrew pantheon, which is the God of peace or the God of the morning or the rising. All right. Now let's continue a little bit more as we cross compare these two fractions of belief systems or mythological systems. Now, Elion, in stories not taught to the common class, and again, the reason religion is so incredible on Africa, they like to keep people in a state of superstition. When a lot of people would lose a lot if the people woke up and realized how fake and mythological this book is. So you see a lot of damage control of various gatekeepers trying to keep this narrative alive because it pays them. Great thing you could do in a time of where everybody's lying is tell the truth. It won't make you popular. It will not make you popular. Trust me, because everybody wants to live a lie because it's convenient. Ya, ya, this, ya, ya, that. But ya goes back to a, uh, an Egyptian pantheon and it's the god of new moons. Or there's nothing original in this, this Bible at all. There's nothing original. Sorry to upset people. So when you go to the story of Elion, he's the Hebrew God, right? He forced himself on two women. And this gave the birth of Shashar and Shalim, who are known as the twins of dawn and dusk, which is also where you get Jesus and Satan, or Jesus and Lucifer, Jupiter and Venus. All right? So this is the story of Elion that they don't tell you in these Bibles, right? And don't expect the church people or the people who are overly invested in this narrative to tell you the truth. They're not going to tell you the truth and lose out on their yar merchandise and their yar cupcakes and their Jesus cupcakes and their Jesus whatever they want to sell you. All right. Well, it's all about facts now. Belief time is over. So Shashar and Shalim. In this story of Elion, it talks about how his organ grew when he saw these two women. Use your imagination for what the organ is. After his organ grew, he was able to reproduce with these two women, moving up and down. All right? Again, it is what it is. But one of them reproduced and he had twins, Shashar and Shalim, dawn and dusk. And all of these mythologies are based on cosmology. It's all based on the heavens and the stars. That's all it is, pretty much, in layman's terms. All right? So what's also fascinating and quite interesting as well is that when we go back into facts, Zeus was also known as a bull. And what Zeus did was in the mythological myth, all right, the mythological story of Zeus, he transforms into a bull to have intercourse with Europa and hence the birth of Europe, all right? Zeus turns into a white bull, has intercourse with a woman called Europa, again forcibly, and then you have the birth of Europa or Europe. Then we see the same motif, but it's not Zeus now, it's our Elion. And our Elion having intercourse, of putting himself on, on a woman and his organ growing and blah, 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 blah. Again, these are all myths. They're not actual events. These are those myth mythological events that people use to explain their heavens or to explain their elements, all right? Now, let's continue. What I found interesting, which stood out to me in this production of Chaos, the movie or the Netflix series, was I was not aware. I was always aware of um, why women are always lambasted and they are promoted as virgins. They want women to always be virgins, prophets and... Just, there's a lot of talk about virgin women, virgin women, virgin women, because women are supposed to be virgins before they got married. Men didn't have to be virgins to marry. The book is very chauvinistic by design and by nature. Now, I, what I didn't understand was in Roman mythology, you have the silent goddess, also known as Tacita. Yeah, Tacita was a goddess of the dead. Dead can't speak, right? <laughs> to seal up the hostile mouse. An unfriendly tongue. So when you go to the book of Maccabees and you got, again, in the mythology of the Maccabees, because that's mythological too. 
and you got the boys having their tongues cut out for not eating pork and all this kind of stuff. It sounds good when you're invested in the narrative, but when you zoom out of the narrative, you realize where they, what inspired all these different stories and how the books were made. Because the Bible is not a book. It is a book of books, poetry, so-called history, so-called wise words. Proverbs is a plagiarized book too. So what, I, what was surprising to me is that um, you have the concept in the New Testament, which was a third, fourth century document. It's talking about let your woman keep silence in the churches for it's not permitted unto them to speak. But they're commanded to be under obedience as also saith the law. Well, if you went, now that makes perfect sense to the audience that that would be right in two. They would know. Because in the Roman mythology, uh, Grecian mythology, you had this concept of the women shutting their mouth and being a silent goddess. Now, according to the Ovid, this occurred because dear Tassica or Tacita had her tongue ripped off by Jupiter. Jupiter was angry with her because she told the nymph or the virgin, the concubine, whatever you want to call them, she told Juturna to flee from him because he planned to rape her. So this woman had her tongue ripped out of her mouth in the mythology because she planned to tell the concubine or the nymph or the sex slave or whatever you want to call them that, yo, he's coming to have his way with you, to force himself on you. As a result, she had her tongue ripped out. And that festival takes place on the 23rd of December. Don't they say silence is golden? <laughs> silence is golden, right? Don't they say there's a, there's a, there's a, a system in place that if you, just, you don't speak railing accusations against the elder, you keep it all in-house? This is cult doctrine 101, all right? I'm showing you the things that inspired the things that we believe right now. Let's move on a bit, though. So, L versus Zeus. L versus Zeus. Now, what's interesting about Zeus, he's the king of the gods. He's the god of the sky. Lightning, thunder, law, and order. Interesting. Law and order. Chaos, a battle. He's a member of the 12 Olympians. When you go to the book of Job, it talks about the God, had a council with the gods and so on and so forth. And God just randomly, or Elion randomly chose Job and said, have you not considered my servant Job? And then took a wager on Job's whole entire life and said to Satan, you can do what you want to him, but just don't take his life. So Satan was under the orders of El Elion in the mythological story. Twelve Olympians, twelve disciples, twelve tribes, twelve constellations. Interesting. So you have the Semitic God or the Canaanite God or the Hebrew God, Elion. He lives on a mountain. He has a symbol of a bull. Then you have Zeus, lives on Mount Olympus. Planet is Jupiter. His symbol is a bull. Elion, often understood as the Most High, is the title used in ancient Near East texts, including the Hebrew Bible. The concept of Elion appears in texts that are believed to date back to the first millennium BCE, but the roots of the idea of a supreme deity may be older. Zeus, as a figure in Greek mythology, is also a product of ancient beliefs, with his worship established by at least the second millennium BCE. In terms of formal religious worship and narrative development, Zeus slightly emerged in its recognizable form before Elion. But both figures have complex origins tied to their respective cultures. Elion's portrayal as the Most High God aligns with older Canaanite and Semitic tradition, while Zeus has roots in earlier Indo European and Agagian mythology. As you can see, Elion's got something in his hand. Zeus has something in his hand. People are saying that the, the, if you look at Elion and you just look at him and his whole demeanor, his, his physiognomy or his facial features, if you just look at the God that people are trying to say is their God 
and the narrative is ridiculous, man. Man's wearing a gnome hat on his head. And he, he scared on. I just don't know what's going on. But anyway, then you see Zeus. And these gods represent the people because the people made the gods. People made these gods. People wrote these books. And it was the priest class, the educated class, not the common class. The common class were given the gods of men to worship a system of belief, which made the priests very profitable and the kings also very profitable. I understood. But check this though. What do you want to get from this? Did you know that Zeus is also called the Most High in his books? Elion is the title of the Most High. Melchizedek, Mel, El, Shezedek refers to El Elion in the older variations of the Bibles. There's no difference between a lot of these mythologies. The only difference is what you choose to mythologize and what you choose is real. That's the only difference. Let's move on a bit more then. Let's look at Jesus versus The story of Zeus predates that of Jesus. Zeus, Jesus. Earth pig, G, Earth, Zeus, pig. Zeus pig. Even Exodus, Exodus. <laughs> Might I say it, Exodus. The book was supposed to be called Names, had nothing to do with no Exodus. And Exodus, I'm sorry to upset people, but truth will upset you. And then you have to come to realization that we've been living a lie, told a lie, taught a lie, loved a lie, spread the lie, and we've all been part of the lie cycle. But now we have to wake up from that lie cycle and put it to bed. Zeus, Jesus versus Zeus. The story of Zeus predates that of Jesus. Zeus is a central figure in ancient Greek mythology, worshipped since at least the second millennium BCE with roots in earlier Indo-European tradition. In contrast, the historical figure alleged of Jesus of Nazareth emerged in the first century CE with his life and teachings forming the basis of Christianity. And Christianity is so diverse. Mormons, Baptists, LDS, SDA. While both figures play significant roles in their respective mythologies and cultures and cultures, the traditions surrounding Zeus were well established long before the narratives surrounding Jesus began to develop. But now people get fresh. His name's not Jesus, it's Yahushua, Yahashua, Yahabasha, blah, 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 blah. All right, cool. It's still based on myth. No, but that's white Jesus. It's black Jesus. It's still based on myth. No, but that's, the, that, 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 that's not my Jesus. Bruv, it's still based on blows and skirt myth. Let's look at Zeus versus Kronos then. So in Greek thought or in Greek uh, theology, the theology was based around fathers and sons, sons and fathers. Egyptian philosophy was based on fathers and sons, sons and fathers. They thought that you could never die if you had a son. You were immortalized when you had a son. If a man has a son, this is why sons were so heavily regarded or wanted in ancient civilizations because a son can continue your name. The son, the son, the son. Literally the son. If the son doesn't rise, you're dead. If you don't have a son, then your legacy is dead. Hence why there was a lot of, um, like I said, son worship. You know, even if you go back to feudal England, you couldn't have, or they would say your heir wouldn't be as strong unless it was a son. This is why Henry VIII was killing all his wives because he wanted a son. And he couldn't understand the contradictions in the Bible because one verse was telling him to sleep with his dead brother's wives and then a next verse was saying not to. And he was confused. Look into the history of Henry VIII and his confusion with the church. He was just confused. It's like, yo, this church is a bag of confusion. All right, but he wanted to have a son to continue his line. Zeus versus Kronos, then. So, Zeus is the son of the Titan or the son of Kronos. Now, you go to Amos, and Amos talks about Volve dig into hell. So, 
digging into hell. Then you go to Judith and it mentions Titans. Language that shouldn't really be found in these documents, to be honest. Titans, because it has nothing to do with the Bible lexicon of words like Titan. What is the heck is Titan doing in the book? It's got nothing to do with the book. It's, it's from a different culture. But you understand why it's in there. Now, the, now, how, as it relates to the Old Testament, it's not really found with all of this how fire and brimstone and all this kind of rhetoric. It's just Sheol, which means the grave. People say, oh, Bible, and they assume it's just one book. You've been misguided if you think that. It's a book with loads of books in it, with written by anonymous authors and written for a single purpose. So when you look into this now, you had a man called um, Jesus, right? Jesus spoke the most about how fire. Jesus was the perfect Roman tool. In fact, I think a Pope even said that we invented Jesus. It's a myth that served us well. And then that's been contested because somebody said that somebody else said it instead. But either, either way, Jesus or the New Testament writers, if that, makes you, if that probably makes it sound better, right? If I say Jesus, there's a lot of connotations. If I say New Testament writers, then you might feel a, a little bit more at peace or at shalim or shalom. All right. But the concept of how fire and burning perpetually was a New Testament concept. Then you've had people that have debated burning forever and ever, and they gave you annihilationism. Basically, you'll burn up according to your wages of sin, as opposed to burning forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Amen. So there's always been politics surrounding this hellfire concept, but the hellfire is, is a recent construction, the way it's been um, given to the masses. You had other concepts of what happens after death. You have Armenti, you have Elysium. These are other ancient beliefs of what happens when you die or after death. All right. So the new concept of hellfire is a New Testament ideal. Now, going back to this though, Zeus's dad is a man called Kronos. And Zeus and his dad had beef because Kronos' power went to his head and Zeus had to have a fight with him to keep him in check. And the son defeated the father. And then the son became the father of the gods. Now, what's interesting about Kronos, Kronos, his planet was Saturn. And his day was Saturday. And his symbol was the grain and sickle. The angels are given a sickle and told to reap the harvest. <laughs> the angels are given a sickle. Separate the wheat from the chaff. Bring the sickle. Show me this. Show me that. Bring me this. Bring me that. When you start to see the comparisons between these morphologies, you'll be... It will be interesting. All right, let's continue for the, the sake of time. Shout out to people that have gone from being just in believers to thinkers because no religious priest wants people thinking. They want the sick and they want to keep them sick and they want to keep draining off you. You understand? Now check this though. Jesus and Dionysus. Now what I found interesting is you had that big Olympic scandal. All right? Where people were saying, oh, blasphemy, blasphemy, you know, the Olympics are blaspheming Jesus because look, it's the last meal supper. How dare they blaspheme Jesus? I'm like, oh my days. People have never read outside of these um, so-called ancient texts, the Bible, right? Or they've never read outside the Quran. They've just never read outside of what they were born into. Never read outside what they were born into. Most Christians, if you speak to them, say, yo. I understand you're a Christian. Have you ever read the Quran? No, it's evil. Then you go to a Muslim. I understand you're a Muslim, but have you ever read the Bible? No, it's evil. So then you have over... How many people are subscribed to this Abrahamic religion? Billions. So you have a lot of ignorance by the billions because they've never been taught to read outside of their book. So you have billions of ignorant people. That's saying that you're ignorant if you don't believe in their books. Imagine that. Billions upon billions of ignorant people. And then the same people that believe in their books have never even read their book. 
So that's super ignorance. Then they're upset with you if you've read their books and their books and you've read outside of the books. And you can see how all the books are based on myths. So let's go to Dionysus then. Dionysus, often depicted as having a miraculous birth, just like Samson. Samson's a very, very interesting character. Totally made up. Totally a fabricated story. Seven locks of the head. Totally made up. With myths stating that he was born from Zeus and Semele, a mortal. So Zeus, just like in the Bible account, it talks about some god of the Bible sending angel Gabriel and then Gabriel saying to Mary, you're going to have a baby. And the spirit overcomes the woman. How does that even work? Was she, co was it, you understand? Was it some rape? Was it consensual? Then how did that even plan out? Because the Holy Spirit is supposed to be a woman. Or is it supposed to be a man? And then how does that happen? And then how is it that we condemn, according to the book of Enoch, angels having intercourse with women, but the Most High can have intercourse with a virgin and produce the son of God. Virgin Virgo, son of God. Interesting. Jesus celebrated for his virgin birth, conceived by the Holy Spirit, emphasizing his divine origin. You see a lot of these stories. It's not unique to the Bible. Dionysus, known for the God of wine, he embodies the transformation of water into wine and reverently associated with it. Jesus performed the miracle of turning water, water into wine at the wedding of Cana, symbolizing spiritual transformation and abundance. Death and resurrection. Dionysus associated with death and rebirth. He undergoes a cycle of death and revival, representing the seasonal cycles of nature. Jesus' is crucifixion and subsequent resurrection signify victory over death and promise of eternal life. Symbolism of wine. Dionysus represented by the vine and grape symbolizing fertility, growth and connection to nature. Jesus refers to himself as a true vine. In the Gospel of John, emphasizing spiritual nourishment and the importance of remaining connected to him. Now, what's interesting, guys, when we get into scholar mode, not Bible scholar mode, just scholar mode without any attachment to any book, right? Just looking at the thing objectively as possible. The book of John is a late addition to the Gospels. It's not a part of the Synoptic Gospels. It's just like a Jimmy Come Lately kind of gospel. Look into it. This is facts. In the Gospel of John, the narrative changes drastically. Look into it. What was also important is that a lot of the merchants during this time period of the New Testament, they were wine merchants. So what is the, what, how great is that to create a religious system where everybody wants wine now as a sacrament? So the people who sell the wine and produce the wine can sell the wine to the church and then the church can guilt trip you if you don't drink the wine of God or the blood of God into not being a part of God. Business, guys. Business 101. Most of the merchants and the bankers of that day were part of the wine cartel. They were part of this beverage, this spirit. <laughs> and it still sells today. The wine of Babylon, they call it, right? But wine was big business back in this day. When you understand the day in which these books came to their maturity, when they matured like wine, New wine, new glass. Listen, if you were a person who was in the wine business, you would want this book to sell because this book would spread and increase your wine business. But let's continue, let's advance. So also as well, years before the concept of the son of God as it relates to the Bible story, you have Dionysus, you have Krishna. Krishna went around healing lepers for crying out loud. You have Mithra. Mithra is associated with bread and wine. And instead of the blood of the lamb, it was the blood of the bull. Then you had Horus. So there's nothing unique. There's nothing original, unfortunately. But what people tend to do is, the programming is this. When you've digested so much of this myth as fact, what people do is say, oh, Satan came down and he tried to copy every event because he wanted to make counterfeits of Jesus so that when real Jesus came, no one would believe in Jesus because Satan had already copied Jesus. So that's what people do when at the highest level of psychosis. When you realize that it's not original, 
Um, you've invested a lot of time and effort and you probably stopped talking to your son or daughter because they don't believe in Jesus or they don't believe in the Bible and you've brushed them aside and kicked them aside and you've ostracized them because you love Zeus. I mean, you love Al. I mean, you love Jesus. I mean, they love Dionysus and you've done all this stuff and now you're realizing it might not be true. Cognitive dissonance kicks in and what people tend to do is blame the never ending scapegoat and say, look, maybe he copied all of this stuff and this is why we have what we have. Now let's continue a bit more on this last one. Um, so Yahweh was an ancient Levantine deity, the national God of the Israelite kingdoms of Israel and Judah. When you think of Yahweh or Yah, people think that Yah is the God of like the creation. But in the Bible book, he's not even the God of creation. Yahweh, Yahuwah, Yahweh, whatever you, you want to do to the Yah thing, he's not the God of the creation. According to your own Bible, not me. According to your Bible, not me. <laughs> to your Bible, not me, you know. Look into it, man. Look into it. If anything's fully popular, please subscribe. You should be awfully suspect. When I was peddling this narrative, Everyone wanted to hear the narrative because they had a black investment or they had an investment about slavery or they had an investment that made them invested. When you tell them the truth now, it's like, yo, I ain't got time for that. I don't want to look like no idiot now. I've told everybody about yah, 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 yah. Now you look like an idiot if you tell them, hold up, we were misinformed. But this is actually the facts now. No one don't want to hear that. No one likes to look like an idiot or a fool. Now check this though. So Yahweh was an ancient Levantine deity, the national god of the Israelite kingdom. Look into that. We've shown you this before. This is just a very brief synopsis. In the early stages of Yahwism, Yahweh was seen as a member of, the, of, of this council, a powerful, fearsome deity capable of unleashing thunderstorms. So you read the Bible, you'll see Yahweh associated with thunder. You even seem associated with bulls, you know, Red heifer offerings, bull offerings. What did they used to offer for Zeus? Bull offerings and lamb offerings. What did they offer to Elion? Bull offerings and lamb offerings. What did they offer to Mithras? Bull offerings and lamb offerings. What did they offer to Horus? Bull offerings and lamb offerings. But what did they not offer to Horus? Pig. They didn't offer pig or pork. Because pig and pork represented Set, represented Seth. The evil one, the evil concept in the duality. What did Yahweh look like? In the tradition of Exodus, for example, Yahweh is depicted as both a storm god and a warrior. What's, your, what's Zeus represented as? The god of thunder. Are we seeing how all these things connect? And even the, the, the all symbology just represents the moon as well. It's all symbolic, not to be taken literally. So you had one level of indoctrination for the common class. Then you had the class above the common class who knew it was just symbols. It's not really Zeus, it's just this. It's not really Horus, it's just the sun. And set is just when the sun sets and the moon comes and they have their daily fight between the sun and the moon. They knew that. But to make it excitable, because people like excitement, innit? people like to hear Marvel Avengers. We like to hear, we like things that are pleasing to the ear. We like losing ourselves in a narrative, right? So they invent stories that keep people drawn into the series. You understand? Because if you just told them the raw truth that it's just this, it's boring. Oh, is that what it is? Oh, is that what it is? And there's some people say like, if you don't scare people with how people, because they have no moral restraint on them, they will just do evil things. So you have to fear monger people to accept the gods. Which goes back to this story now of chaos. So I think the first episode, man, this guy, the people are fed up with the religious system and the abuse of the people that are in control of the religious system, right? So as a result, they blaspheme against Zeus and say Zeus is an idiot. And then when Zeus sees that, when he looks down on earth and he sees, oh, they're blaspheming against my name. He says, I'm going to wipe them out. He says, I'm going to introduce fire. I'm going to introduce floods. I'm going to introduce all kinds of mannerisms to get the people oppressed or feeling scared of me. 
because without fear, they won't worship me. All right. So we start doing kinds of stuff with the weather, disturbing people's peace, their shalam, their shalim. And then as a result, he hopes that people will return to the gods and worship the gods with more sacrifices, more obediences, so on and so forth. So if you do get a chance here, yeah, check it out. But at the same time, there are things in this program that's, that's just off. Obviously, there's a lot of stuff in there that you're going to have to fast forward. But the main crux of it is interesting because the same way we look, we think the Greeks were idiots because, oh, the Bible says we're vain philosophy and all this kind of stuff. And we haven't believed in fables or tales and all that kind of stuff. When a book is a book of tales and myths, the Bible is a book of tales and myths telling you it's not a book of tales and myths. Because the people who wrote this book, they did a lot of preemptive damage control. So when you look at this story, law and order, chaos, and how the gods create chaos and then bring law and order. But the gods, are, the, the gods that bring the chaos are really just people putting themselves in a position of being voices for God to manipulate and control the masses. Then when you just pause and zoom out of all the myths, you see El, his son, his Jesus, or Aesus, because there's no J, it was an I. Or you can say Yahushua if that makes you feel better. It's still part of the myth. And you have Kronos, who's a father of the ancient gods, who's dethroned by his son, Zeus, who then becomes the king of the gods. And he's a part of the royal or the 12 Olympian gods or the council of the gods. And not only that, but Kronos is the one who's kept in Tartarus. When you go to the New Testament, you know, the language of hell. You even see in Peter, it talks about Tartarus. All these themes that you find in the Bible were taken from other places. The Bible's third, fourth century product. The mythology of Zeus predates New Testament, predates elements of Old Testament, because Old Testament, truth be told, was written in Alexandria. Look into how this book even came to be. You'll be surprised, man. And the oldest version of the Bible is in Greek. And the second oldest is in Latin. So you do the math on that. After upsetting people with the truth, I'm going to call it a day. But do me a favor, man, and do yourself a favor and do your children a favor. There's no point saying stuff like, oh, you know, them, them people back in the day were so superstitious, worshipping Greek gods and then those Egyptians were so superstitious, worshipping Egyptian gods. And... But we're not superstitious because we believe in one God. Monotheism or Abraham. And then you realise Abraham's made up too, unfortunately. Sarah, Abraham, it's all made up. But it was made up for a reason. So that it could keep people on the straight and narrow. But when you understand this myth... Ultimately, these stories were created, invented to keep people conformed to the state. Giving offerings to the state. Volunteering for soft taxes towards the state. To continue the pre-system of exploitation. Truth be told, if you think you only got morals because you read a Bible. Or because you read some holy book. You need to analyse yourself, analyse your life bro. Because a lot of the things that you you're probably more than this Bible. Little children have more morals than this Bible, this Quran. Because we're born with the knowledge of good and evil. We know we shouldn't kill. Under your parents, why does that commandment come with, oh, if you honor your parents, the land which I will bring you to, you'll have longevity. Why, why is it attached to that? You'll, you'll realize why it's attached to that. It's all political. It's, that's the only commandment that has something attached with land and longevity. The land you go to. Come on, guys. Wake up and smile the coffee. Big up. Bless up. And try your very, very best to think objectively. Megan.